Welcome back to Vote 17. For those who haven't been with us, my name is Alex Gregory. This is a student-produced election series interviewing a different politician every week in the lead-up to the election. To get involved, like our Facebook page and send us a message with the questions you would like us to put to the politicians. I'm joined this week by my co-host, Anya Gipp. Hi, everyone. Today, we're delighted to be joined by David Clark, Dunedin North's Labour MP. Welcome, David, and thank you for joining with Thanks, us. Thanks, Anya. Thanks, Alex. So, uh, last election, you increased your Dunedin North majority from 13 to 16,000. Um, do you see yourself winning this again for the third time round, and what do you attribute this success to? Well, I'm optimistic uh, this time round as well. Last time we campaigned uh, in a major way around the hospital redevelopment because I was concerned before the last election about delays to the hospital build. And three years on, next election, uh, and actually we seem to be further away than we were three years ago. So I think the issues that we're campaigning on are huge for the city and I think people are incredibly frustrated with the government. So while I'd like to say I was doing everything right, I think part of it is frustration with the lack of progress from the current government. I'm very fortunate to have an amazing campaign team, so we've got a, a bigger campaign than we've ever had. A lot of students on campus really energised and out there on the phones, knocking on doors uh, and so on. And so I'm, I'm really hopeful of increasing that majority, yes. So as the Labour health spokesperson, you said that Jonathan Coleman is dangerously out of touch. What would you do differently if you're in power? Well, I think I'd start by meeting the groups in the health sector. I think that's um, pretty incumbent and important for a health minister to do. Uh, right now, uh, I go to Fora. I went to one last night in Christchurch at the uh, Cardboard Cathedral. Every party represented there, just about the minister absent. And that is becoming a pattern across the country. I addressed four or five hundred GPs in Rotorua recently at their annual conference. Uh, no minister, Coleman, showing up. And the sector is thoroughly sick of that. They, they think that they deserve to have a connection to the person who's in charge of their sector. I think they're right. Um, even if they're doing things, our government's doing things that the people in the sector are unhappy about or uncomfortable with, the onus is on the minister to actually meet with them. OK, so recently they announced that they're going to spend 1.2 to 1.4 billion on a new mm. hospital for Dunedin. Is that, is that the solution or is that just part of the picture for you? Look, um, for Dunedin that is incredibly important. Our hospital leaks, uh, surgery gets postponed when it rains. Um, we know that there's asbestos throughout the building. People have to put hazmat suits on to go and get medical records. It's simply unacceptable. Needs to be sorted out. It's needed to be sorted out for a while, right? Um, and so it is, of course, an important part of the solution. Labor's promised to commence construction in the first term of a Labor government, and uh, that's well ahead of where the government say that they are. And I think that's because they're exploring a PPP, which takes years to put together. Um, we've ruled that out. We've said, actually, this needs to be a public facility built for the public to use. It's not about making profit at the expense of the population. OK, so um, recently Hilary Calvert, a Dunedin City Councillor, or ex-Dunedin mm. City Councillor, put forward a proposal where she sees that the sort of area health board model, whereby you know, local people elect a, a district health board and then they get money from Vote Health, she sees that as sort of a, a restriction or a, or a, a way of um, the government hiding behind systemic underfunding. Um, I guess the question for you is, 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 do you think that there is systemic underfunding or do you think it's, um, it's a, a problem with the local health boards? In, in terms of systemic underfunding, absolutely, I think that's the issue. That, and that's why Labor's pledged to put $8 billion more in over the next four years than the national government has, which is not small beer. You'll appreciate $8 billion. Um, and that, that is to start to address the underfunding. We had Infometrics, which is an independent economic research company, look at the Treasury data um, with an ageing population, um, a growing population actually, uh, and more complex needs, we asked them what it would cost, what the government would need to have put into the system to deliver just the same level of service since 2009, and Infometrics analysis said $2.3 billion. So that's the amount stripped out of the system in terms of maintaining thresholds. So if you need um, a cataract operation or hip surgery or knee surgery, or you need to get access to mental health services, um, that, that level of of care, the threshold for care has gone up and up and up. So it's no longer the case that if you're suicidal, you're automatically accepted um, by psych services. Um, you've actually got to have something else going on before it's not simply enough to say you're suicidal. And I think that's entirely inappropriate. It's, it's um, awful that we've come to that. Um, and it's awful that people are going blind waiting for surgery. We need to make sure the health system is properly funded because I think most New Zealanders would agree with me, every New Zealander should have affordable access to quality health care.
Okay, but I guess Hillary's argument perhaps is that um, you know, the area or district health board model allows the government to say that actually it's the, it's the Southern District Health, health Board or the, or the Canterbury District Health Board that has sort of mismanaged those funds. Um, you know, the, they're not providing the cataract operations or whatever. If you came into power, would you, would you maybe look at revisiting the way that we structure um, how vote health is spent? Look, I, I absolutely would uh, look at structural change, probably not quite along the lines that Hillary's imagining. Um, you know, it's a kind of a strange thing for an ex-ACT MP to be putting forward to, to say let's take the market aspects completely out of the health system. Um, but, you know, I think part of what she's saying is, is targeting um, admis administrative factors and, and administrative layers. And there is a concern that they absorb money in the health system. Uh, I think we've also got to remember that when you take out those administrative layers, as, as successive governments have tried to do, what tends to happen is that surgeons get on there with their two-fingered typing on the keyboard paid, you know, hundreds of dollars an hour doing the stuff that currently the administrators are doing much quick, more quickly and much cheaper. So you've got to be a little bit careful how much of that administration you take out of the system uh, and, and what the unintended consequences of it might be. So you've spoken about the healthcare system overall and we understand that um, Labor's stance on the rebuild of the Dunedin Hospital will have great implications for health in general in Dunedin. Um, but can you be any more specific about Labor's mental health policies? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so mental health is huge in New Zealand. Uh, everywhere I go in the country, um, people I meet, somebody in their immediate family or in their circle of friends has been affected. Right? It's that immediate. We've got the worst youth, uh, teenage suicide statistics in the world. Um, this is real and we need to sort it out. The number of people presenting um, to mental health services has gone up 60% in the last decade and funding's gone up by less than half of that. We basically, I think most importantly, agree with what the People's Mental Health Review suggested. They came to Parliament, 500 people told their personal stories of interaction with the mental health system, 12,500 people signed an open letter to the Minister saying we need some change. But here's the four things that we think are sensible. Review the system, put some funding in once you've reviewed it so you know what, where it's going and where it would sensibly be spent, have some independent oversight of the mental health sector so that different governments are held to account by an independent oversight. Um, and some more education, because all of that education funding has dried up. Those are incredibly reasonable requests. And we've said, look, we want to do those things, and we've got a few other plans uh, as well. Nurses in every secondary school with mental health training, so that every secondary school in the country has access to people with specialist uh, services and the ability to refer. And that's been, that's been done in um, decile one and two schools. They've been academically looked at out of Auckland University, and we've taken the best out of that model and said, let's roll that out to every school in the country. Um, on top of that, we're doing a pilot with, um, in primary care, so that when you go and see your GP, um, it starts out with the, the most vulnerable populations, about 400,000 to be served to start with. Uh, you go in there, your consultation with the GP is free because um, you're presenting with a mental health issue. Then, because it's only 15 minutes and you don't solve a mental health issue in 15 minutes, you have access in the same practice to a mental health coordinator who has some relevant training, uh, can follow up on the phone, spend more time with you, uh, can of course refer if need be. But it means that there's an access point for mild to moderate mental health conditions. And right now that is really difficult unless you've got deep pockets and people even then don't know where to go if you've got anxiety or depression, where the starting point is. So we want to do a whole lot of stuff straight off the bat. Um, whilst that review's going on, we don't think we can afford to wait. We actually need to get on with some of the solutions that are out there and obvious. So you're saying the current issue is surrounding lack of accessibility or perhaps resources in this area? Yep, absolutely. So accessibility is, is huge. You know, if literally people with anxiety or depression um, don't quite know where to turn. And, and for some, they will go to their GP, they'll get some pills. The GPs that I talk to say they, they are really concerned because somebody comes in, they've got a mental health issue, 15 minutes doesn't cut it. So they, they do frequently go to 30 minutes, but even then, you know, it, it's usually only brought up at the end of the appointment. It's something somebody's really finding struggling words to talk about. Um, the medication itself you have to talk about for a period of time. They know they can't help the patients like they want to. So that particular policy we've put forward was suggested by the PHOs themselves. Uh, they put it to the government and the government said, oh look, we'll look at it next year. It's not a priority for us this now. We've picked it up and run with it. This policy being the nurses and schools policy? No, that's the, the one in the, in the GP practices okay. was put to the government and we, we've tweaked it a little, but by and large it's what's come out of the sector saying this is the logical thing at the coalface that needs to be done. And we've said, that sounds pretty sensible. Um, I think for the government the big issue has been they've put a stranglehold on funding so all the good suggestions that are coming forward they're just saying no because they haven't got the money to put toward it.
Okay, so just on those nurses and schools, right? Mm. Because I mean, we all know the, the statistics on youth, youth suicide. Yep. Um, so what, what's the role of the nurse in the school to do? So the nurse, the, the formula is five nurse hours per 100 students per week, right? So for most secondary schools, that'll mean a full-time nurse in the school. They'll have, they'll have a mixed role. They'll be doing um, a diet um, teaching in class and so on and so forth. But they'll also be available for consults on mental health so that people know there's a trusted person that's known in the school that they can approach who has expertise in the area. So we want to make sure also that guidance counselling is properly supported in the schools too because there are already people working. Some schools have social workers, not many. Um, and we want to make sure that there's actually a team there who have this as a priority. And by putting extra resource in, um, that actually makes it possible. If you talk to the guidance counsellors, plenty have come to see me. They are so stretched right now. Um, they cannot keep up with what's going on in schools. And we know, you know, anybody who's, who's young or, or interacts with younger people knows the increase in mental health demand that's going on right now. The pressures are extraordinary. So about those sort of pressures, where do you think they're coming from? Uh, look, there's been lots of, I'm not an expert on exactly where they're coming from. Social media cops a lot of blame. Um, I don't know the extent to which that is a factor. I think um, young people are expected to earlier on in their lives get into a, a real grind of uh, weekly outputs and so on um, and and you know I remember when I was at university uh, we had a little bit more time to, to think and, and develop our own um, agendas um, and I can remember in fact when uh, internal assessment was introduced and it was sitting at I think it was 10% to start with and we had a heart attack um, collectively because it meant suddenly you had to turn up to lectures and all these other horrible things um, that because some of your performance was measured on it and, and so it really changed the whole dynamic and then next thing it was 30% of your, your assessment was internal assessment and, and you know I, I can remember just being exasperated at that uh, because, it, because traditionally for a lot of people they went to university they spent a lot of time exploring other things of course we studied as well um, but there was a lot of a lot a lot more focus on the final exams and a period where you really focused on crunching the academic um, uh, box and ticking it. Um, but before that, you also got to explore other things. So I think there are a whole lot of different pressures that have come on young people through NCEA as well, um, the systems that we have in place, um, and you know th it's a global phenomenon too. There there is uh, a recognised global phenomenon where young people are experiencing more anxiety and distress. Okay, so you've talked about mental health, and that's obviously a massive youth issue for the upcoming election. Mm. Um, another issue that's really interesting for young people is, of course, education. Mm. So Labour has a policy on three years free post-school education. Can you clarify exactly what this means and what Labour hopes to achieve with this? Yeah, so right now we've got um, our policy is that we will um, have three years post-school uh, e education that's free. Um, that will be introduced gradually over time. We're actually, there's been lots of speculation in the media, we're having another hard look at that um, now that the prefu numbers are out for those that, um, uh, geeks like me that follow the Treasury <laughs> uh, releases. Um, and we're seeing how we can better support students because um, right now we, we know as well that loans and allowances haven't kept up with inflation. Um, I, I used to run Selwyn College on campus and even, even um, you know, kind of six years ago, it was true that you couldn't pay for all of your um, all of your year's uh, living costs out of the allowances and, and loans that were available to you. You had to work all through the summer, and even then, if you're on minimum wage, you couldn't quite make enough money. So, you know, and it's got worse. So that pressure is there. Why are we doing it? Why do we want free post secondary education? Because we believe that education is the building blocks of opportunity. Um, it was a Labour party that made secondary education free. If it wasn't for Labour, um, there wouldn't be free secondary education in New Zealand. You wouldn't have uh, that option and many people would miss out. Right now I think most people would agree that having free secondary education is a good idea. We do want people to be educated beyond primary school. Um, we think everybody should have it and I think you know where the world's going we're going to think that everybody needs um, further qualifications than that. So we want to make sure everyone has access um, to education. Labor's always believed that and I guess this is the next step on that journey. Do you think that currently though people are missing out? Yes, absolutely. A lot are most missing out. I did a, when I was at Treasury, I worked at the Treasury once upon a time, please forgive me for that. Um, uh, many years ago, uh, I looked at, at um, you know, how the tertiary sector should be structured, um, who, goes, who goes to university, who goes to polytech, and you know, what does the country get out of it. It was a Treasury special project. And one of the things that's really obvious out of that is that people from lower socioeconomic um, backgrounds tend to be much more debt averse. 
Um, so they're much less likely to, to take on an education if, it, if they're going to have to borrow from someone, even if they can get uh, money from the state. Um, and, and of course if they don't look after their own opportunities and pursue the opportunities available to them, that affects all of those around them, um, their, their subsequent family and so on. It also affects New Zealand's GDP because if they're not earning more money, the country as a whole isn't earning more money because we are the grand total of all of our GDP added up together. Um, so there's, there's an opportunity lost for the country. So it makes a lot of sense to invest in post-secondary education just from an investment perspective. Um, on top of that, the biggest predictor of tertiary success is your mother's level of education. Second biggest is your father's, um, then peers and mentors, um, socioeconomic status is further down the list. Uh, and we need to make it easy for those people who have talents but don't have parents with deep pockets to get into the system where they can make the most of their opportunities for their own good, for the good of those around them, but also for the country as a whole. So you've spoken about that being an investment for New Zealand society and, and mm. education being great for the country as a whole. But what then, with what is essentially a free qualification from the government, is the incentive for students to then stay in New Zealand rather than pursuing opportunities overseas and reinvest those skills back into this society? Well, I think people are always going to travel after university, and, and that's great. You know, actually, the over six experience is pretty good. Um, we've got an amazing country here, and an awful lot of people choose to come back, and an awful lot of people choose to come here. You know, that in terms of those who emigrate to New Zealand from other countries, um, a lot of them have, you know, the, the bulk of them are very highly skilled. We have some issues with some low skilled uh, immigration, but we've got some extraordinary people that come in too. Um, so some people will leave. I think we just have to face that fact as a country, that, so that's the reality. you wouldn't the reality. want them as New Zealand First is oh, suggesting? Look, there, there, are, there are always schemes available for that. We do that currently in, um, for rural GPs, you know, and it, it might be around living costs or it might be around something else. Um, there, there, are, there are opportunities to bond people. Um, I, I think that what happened before we had um, those student loans and so on was that people still stayed in New Zealand, you know. Um, my parents uh, were in the fortunate position of being able to access tertiary education, certainly my father when he was a younger man, he's still in New Zealand, you know. That, that, that happened, the change in behaviour isn't that extreme, and in fact, I think people with big loans are more likely to go overseas um, because they feel they need to earn big dollars somewhere else to pay off their loans. So you may find it's actually the other way around. I don't know the stats on that, but there's, there's incentives both ways, and I don't think that that's the overriding factor. And in terms of implementing this policy, um, there would of course be students such as ourselves who have already accumulated debt mm. or students have completed their study and have a debt mm. um, and have already paid for what students coming out of high school would effectively be getting free. Is there going to be any kind of mediation process for this or is it simply going to be a cut off date? I, I, as our plan currently says, no. I mean, I, I, I had. Um, I went through paying for all of my education um, and in fact we had interest on our um, loans at that stage so while I was studying I saw my, my loan going up and up and up and up and up. Thankfully a Labor government came in and took the interest off student loans. Um, Labor always tries to make education more affordable um, and, and you guys will be the beneficiaries of that. Um, so you can thank Labor whenever you like for that. Um, uh, but you know, we, we will always look to make education more accessible and more affordable, but there will always be winners and losers when you change policy. And um, as our policy currently stands, um, students currently studying don't stand to benefit from that. So you, you're talking a bit about opportunity um, that sort of education gives the individual, um, and also about access. And I think that's really important to drill down into. Um, so, you know, the government already contributes 66% of the tuition fees, as I understand it, and about 80% of the total cost of, um, you know, domestic students going to university. Uh, if the problem um, for, you know, lower socioeconomic people is that they are debt averse, um, would you not think a targeted sort of um, tuition fee scholarship would be a better use of money than a universal benefit, you know, mm. to people whose parents probably own, you know, million dollar houses. Yeah, well, what, what um, there's several aspects there. One, one is that, um, you know, there are scholarships available for those from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. It's a starting point, it's not the answer that's fully, uh, th th that's going to achieve all of it. Um, but um, I think also the other thing to, to note is that when, when um, education used to be free, there was a much bigger onus on people to go out and, and serve society, you know, the critic and conscience notion of a university. Um, and right now, I think we've got the worst of both worlds. So we've got people, 
regardless of whether they've got wealthy backgrounds, and often it is the ones with wealthy backgrounds, coming in, getting the majority of their education paid for by the state, and then going out and saying, I've got a big loan, I'm not going to work as a doctor in Otara, where there's a, a really low um, rate of GPs, I'm going to go and work in Rimuera, because even though there's one GP per, I don't know, whatever it is, 100 people or whatever, I'm still going to go and work there, because I know I can charge more and pay down my loan. It becomes very personal. So right now it feels like we've got the worst of both worlds, where the state pays the majority of it, but people still um, behave as though it's them that's uh, the one bearing the most cost. When it's free, I think there's a much uh, clearer case for saying, actually, all of you who are here uh, are here by virtue of the society supporting you, and there's a real expectation that you go out and do social good at the end of it. That's really interesting. I've never thought of it that way. Um, so thank you for that. I guess another contentious sort of election issue, especially over the past couple of weeks, has been um, the proposal of a tax or a royalty on water. I was wondering, um, perhaps, if you could just explain the Labour Party's motivations for this. Yeah, um, so a royalty on water is a recognition, one, that, that it's a limited resource, right? And um, any kind of royalty system or any, any you know, Way, way of you know emissions trading scheme or whatever is a way of for the market to try and reward those people who use a resource well and in public interest, um, and make sure that those who are who are not necessarily doing it in the public interest but could uh, incentivise to to behave more in line with the public interest, um, and so we want that royalty also to go back to to regional councils um, to aid with clean up work. So it, so it's kind of you know it's a way of making sure that that clean up work is is happening. So we we want that levy to be set, well set, informed ministers will ultimately make the decision, but we're asking Treasury to recommend a level for that levy so that it doesn't put businesses out of out of, uh, out of of business across the country, um, but make sure that, that um, you know, industries are kept going in a sustainable way. Um, there will be winners and losers, there always is when you introduce a market and a, and a real price on things, but, but we want it to be sustainable and we want, so we want the Treasury to set that at a level because they understand business and, and the importance of farming to our economy. So when we're not going to be having $18 cabbages? $18 cabbages I think uh, are off the table, no matter how often Nick Smith says it, there won't be any, any $18 cabbages. Okay, so if the goal is um, you know, to recognise that water is a public and a, and a finite resource yep. um, and, and we get people to pay for it, that's one thing, but a, a sort of similar but um, slightly separate issue is the quality of our waterways. Mm. How do you think taxing the use of water um, when it can be used you know, in sort of for, for, for making plants or, or, or farming cows, um, you know, growing grass, how do you think um, taxing water addresses the waterway issue? Well, we've also said, um, so it's, it's a royalty for the use of the water, right? So um, we've also said that we want to um, make, change the rules around dairying so that you can't intensify um, just by right. Uh, it'll become, uh, it will no longer be what's called a, it's a technical term, but permitted activity under the RMA. You will actually have to re require, you'll have to put forward a case for how you're going to make your farming operation more sustainable if you want to increase your dairy herd. So we've got, there's a number of measures, right? There's not one thing, there's not one silver bullet, but we know that our waterways are more polluted than they used to be, and we know that that's having effects across the population. We know it also is harming what now is our biggest industry, which is tourism, um, because we rely on a clean green image, and we've got to make sure that's real, not only for the future health of our future generations, but also for the, the biggest earner now in our economy for, for tourism. Okay, and a, a, another contentious sort of issue um, on Twitter and social media and in the media the last couple of weeks has been um, Labour's talk around not eliminating um, changes to the existing sort of capital gains tax. Um, could you explain a little bit about your reasoning for exempting the family home? Yeah, well we, we I mean all that's happened so far is Jacinda Ardern, our, our new leader, who seems to be quite popular, um, has uh, ruled out that as one option. Right, so she's just said, I mean, nobody in the world's done it, is the truth. Um, so I, I think, you know, and, and also it puts a lot of fear in, in people, you know, they, they, people do see their own home uh, as, a, as a place of security and of opportunity. What, what seems to force house prices up is speculation in the market when people have multiple homes. Um, and, and the reality is, when in Australia, I used to be our tax spokesperson, I'm not going to be able to remember the exact amount, but but the Australian capital gains tax they have there, you know, it's only the, the, the vast majority of it's paid by the top 10% of um, uh, earners in the country and, and even within that, you know, the top 1% pay a huge chunk of it. So it's, it's um, but look, we, we haven't said it's going to be a capital gains tax. There are a range of different 
um, options available and the capital gains tax might not be the best one when a tax working group sits down and works through what all the options are. What we do know is that in New Zealand there are a lot of people who are not paying tax and they tend to be already quite wealthy who own a lot of assets and we know that the, the ordinary person who works a day job pays tax at every single point along the way. And that's not fair. And people know that's not right. We're one of three countries in the Western world that doesn't have a capital gains tax. We need to do something to address those inequalities that are growing faster than ever. Well, in that case then, why would we exempt, you know, the capital gains that a family living in Rumuera with a one and a half million dollar family home mm. make on their, you know, appreciating assets? and yet we'd tax someone, you know, maybe 33 cents on the dollar for the interest that they're making on, you know, the $100,000 they got on their KiwiSaver. Yeah, look, well, um, the, uh, you'd have to ask all of the OECD countries that, that have got one, which is most, right, and most, uh, most wealthy countries in the world say that that's the fairer system. I went to, before the last election, when I was our tax spokesperson, I went to a large conference in Auckland with academics and people from all of the major accounting firms and so on. And their view was that um, whatever you did with a, with a introducing capital gains tax since we're talking about them, um, was that you uh, make sure that you introduce one, you know, and, and people said, well, the, the American one's got so many exemptions, it's awful, it's full of holes and all of that, surely you don't want that. And the, the view coming back from the American expert was, uh, the only thing worse than a capital gains tax that's full of holes is no capital gains tax. Um, you know, and, and um, there, are, there are examples around the world um, that have been more recently introduced, like South Africa and Canada. If, if we do go down that track, and you know, I, as I say, all those other options are on the table, it might not be. If we went down that track, um, you'd look at what the best models in the world are. But with exempting the family home, is this a question of political expediency? I mean, you talk about people being fearful of a capital gains tax on their home. We know overwhelmingly that the people who vote are the home-owning, slightly older people, and the people who don't are the people who don't own homes and who are younger. So is it a question that Labor just wants to get into power, or is it a question that they're actually going to address the inequality that's, that's driven by home ownership? Well, the, the tax working group will have as its, as its um, mandate to, to look at the inequality question and how we best address that. Great. Well, looking towards the election now, we of course can't go without saying something about Jacinta Ardern. She's um, obviously taken over the, lean, the reins of the, le the leadership, um, leadership, and um, do you think that Labor's increase in uh, seeing it shoot up in the polls has been because of personality politics, or do you really believe that there's been potential voters swayed by policy change? Uh, look, well, it's, it's always going to be hard to separate the two out, I think. I, I do think Jacinda's incredibly popular because she's a great communicator. I, know, I, I just think we need to be upfront about that. She, she is really good at communicating her values uh, and their values that are entirely aligned with the Labour Party. She's a friend of mine since before I was in Parliament, before she was in Parliament. Um, she's always been somebody with a really clear set of values. Um, she's super smart. I work with, lots of, uh, on, with her on lots of policy issues, uh, particularly around small business and economic development when we each held those respective of portfolios, we wrote, co-wrote a paper for the Future of Work project uh, and so on. Um, so you know, I think um, part of it is, is her, she just embodies that set of values, she communicates it incredibly well, but we are also releasing a lot of policy, you know, if you go to our policies already announced page on the Labour website, um, you can sit down for several days uh, without sleep. Um, and read to your heart's content there's policy for, for Africa and, and the Labour Party I don't think has ever been accused of not putting out uh, sufficient policy. That is the one thing that we, uh, we are very good at. Um, communicating our message is something that we sometimes find a bit challenging. Perfect. So we like to conclude each of our interviews with a series of quick fire questions um, sure. just to get to know the candidates on I sure. guess a different level. Yep. Uh, so are you ready? I'm uh, as ready as I'm going to be, Alex. All right, um, yep. what's your favourite university hall? Oh, well, it has to be Selwyn. That's so I spent most of my, or uh, well, a good chunk of my life there. Um, 2011, when I left, was my 11th year living in the college one way or another. <laughs> now, you're an avid Snapchatter. Um, is there anything that you could, any top tips you can give us for a quality Snapchat? <laughs> I, honestly, I think I've still got my Luna wheels on with Snapchat. <laughs> um, I resisted it for a while. I don't know why. It's a lot of fun. I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying it. And uh, yeah, I think it's been noted that I've been on it quite a bit lately. What's your favourite filter? Um, I've, been t I've been recommended no filters. I love my Bitmojis <laughs> though. I love my Bitmojis. Uh, I don't think you'll get a snap without a Bitmoji in it. So when's your snap score going to overtake David Seymour's? I, I don't even know what his is actually. I haven't been watching anyone else in that respect. Um, so there's no competition there? Uh, I, 
No, of course there is. Uh, once you tell me what it is, I'll, I'll, be, I'll, I'll be chasing him. So we can expect some uh, Snapchat spam in the, in the weeks to come? Oh, absolutely plenty. Okay, what's the best place in Dunedin to get a coffee? Um, well, there's a lot of good places actually. Um, Dunedin is one of the best places in the country to get a coffee. I get, I get my coffee often from The Fix, which is just around the corner from my office. Hunter Centre's pretty good. Um, there are some great, you know, I actually think we've got great coffee all around the city. And lastly, any more kids on the cards? And does being a father affect your ability to perform <laughs> as an MP? That is an outrageous <laughs> question. Um, yeah, can, no, can you and, point at and, us? And, and, yeah, <laughs> and truly shocking um, that, that this should not be a question in this day and age. Um, uh, yeah, look, um, I, I just don't think that should be a question. All right. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Thanks, all right. David. Um, Unfortunately, that's all we've actually got time for today, but we'll be back next week with more insight into um, some of the political issues that matter. And in the meantime, um, send us through your questions. We'd love to hear from Brilliant. you. Thanks for having me on the show, guys. It's been really enjoyable, and thanks for the probing questions. Good awesome. to you. Great. Thank you so much. Cheers. Thank you very much.